one of the many, many things that I uh, that I love about this church is our desire, uh, our mutual desire to serve the Lord. Uh, I have seen churches uh, where that may not always be able to be said. Uh, and whenever a church does not have that desire, they're totally missing out on what God uh, has for them. And we may not always agree here on the best way to go about doing it. And there are maybe times, uh, matter of fact, there are times that we try things, I know myself specifically, uh, that try things that don't work. But that's okay. Because as long as we've got that uh, that goal of serving God and spreading His kingdom, being disciples that make disciples, uh, then we are going to be able to work together and to serve Him and to accomplish what He wants us to accomplish. Now, this morning what we're going to do is I want us to see why we serve the Lord. I want us to see just how vitally important the, the reason for our service is. In fact, by looking at God's Word, what we're going to see this morning is that if we don't get the, the motivation behind our service right, then our service to Him is, is going to amount to nothing. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at this book that uh, uh, the Apostle John wrote, and we're going to look at one of the uh, seven churches that he sent a letter to from and see where Jesus lays this out, where he lays out the specific reasons why we do what we do here. And then we're going to see what happens when it's not right. So let's begin here by looking at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant, it, grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this church, the church at Ephesus, uh, this is the same church that the book of Ephesians is written to. And Jesus here lays out for them, lays out for us to read as well, the service that this church was doing for him. Now, to give you a little background on this church and the city that it was in, the city of Ephesus is not some small off-the-map place. This is one of the capitals, one of the key cities in this part of the world. It is a very large city. There's about 250,000 people there. It's a very diverse city, and it's also a very pagan city. Matter of fact, this place is home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's home to the temple that was built to the goddess Diana. So this church is not in an easy place to serve. A very pagan society, a society that does not know the Lord. This church, though, has a very great history. This church is built in a way that not a lot of other churches could, could attest to. When you read the New Testament, when you read uh, the book of Acts, when you study church history, you'll find out that as far as the leaders of this church and the people that helped lay the foundation, the people that discipled people here, the people that pastored this church even, some of the names that are included on that list are the people like the Apostle Paul and Timothy John, who wrote this book, what we know from church history, he probably pastored this church for roughly 30 years. People from the book of Acts, like Aquila and Priscilla, that worked with the Apostle Paul. Apollos, who was a disciple of Jesus, 
going around teaching in some of the same areas that the Apostle Paul did. All these people served here. So they've got a great foundation. They've got an awesome start. And they served well. This church is serving the Lord in ways that a lot of other churches don't. Just by looking at the first few verses here, we find out that this church worked hard. That's the picture that is presented here, the working to the point of exhaustion in their service to the Lord. So it's obviously a priority for them. They did not quit because it was hard. That lets us know that the society that they're in, from what history tells us and how pagan it actually was, is true. It can be hard to serve the Lord in a a place like this. They could not stand evil. They did not want evil around. They were, were living their life resisting the temptation that would come their way from a place like this. And they would not stand for false teaching or false teachers. Now, before we go any further, let us make this perfectly clear. All of these things that Jesus is saying that they are doing are good, and they cannot be minimized. In a society that they existed in, this is not a given. It's not easy. It may be easy to serve the Lord where the Lord is acceptable, right? But here it is not acceptable. I could stop with that, not move on to the next point, and just talk about those particular things from God's Word. And it would apply to this church, it would apply to every church in our society today, living in a society that does not want what Jesus presents, that does not want the gospel that that Jesus gave us. It's not always easy. And in our society today, there's far too many churches that miss what Jesus is commending them for here. In our society, churches are caving to a feel-good, prosperity, me first, all about what I want, what can Jesus do for me, heavenly Santa Claus, sort of gospel. That's what we get presented from a lot of churches and a lot of places that use the name of Jesus. We've got a society today where we, it's, it's easy and our churches are starting to follow the sentiments and the ideas and the thoughts and the wisdom of the world instead of the wisdom that God has given us. I thank God this is not a church like that and let us never become a church like that because a church like that, it's very hard to actually use the name church for. A church like that, it's very hard to get to the place where we could actually say we're serving the Lord. And in Western society today, you could not say about a lot of churches that they work hard, that they don't quit, that they can't stand evil, that they resist temptation, and they won't stand for false teaching or false teachers. All we have to do is look at at the debates that denominations have, the, the, the decisions that they make on what is sin and what is not sin. I, I was reading, uh, <clears throat> it, it hasn't been that long ago, just a couple of weeks, <clears throat> and where the, uh, the, Church of, uh, the Church of England now, um, and I know that the Church of England, it, yeah, England, all that, still Western society, right, the direction that our society is heading. Uh, the Church of England now has told their, their churches that um, what they should do whenever somebody decides that they are transgender is to mark that occasion with baptism as a special, let's set this apart because it's a great day. The Methodist church is in a debate now, has been for a while, um, about whether or not homosexuality is a sin and whether they should let their ministers be openly homosexual just like the Presbyterian church was not too long ago. And I'm not trying to knock all those, uh, I'm not trying to knock those people. But what I am trying to do is present the case, present the state of, of the church in this society today and look at this church here and I don't want us to think that our society is somehow unique throughout history. It's not. Matter of fact, ours is probably not as bad as some of the, some of the, the cultures that these churches existed in, including this church at Ephesus, and Jesus is commending them for doing still what He has told them to do. 
So let us never become a church that does not do these things, that doesn't work hard to serve the Lord. Let us never become a church that quits just because things get hard. Let us never become a church that starts to be okay and comfortable with evil and sin and can't resist temptation. And let us never get to the point where false teaching and false teachers are okay as long as they don't make us uncomfortable. This church was not like that. This church was doing exactly what Jesus had told us, had told them to do and what he tells us to do. But if all a church is doing is these things right, if all they're doing is trying to get these things right, if all they are doing is focusing on this, then they've missed the mark. If all we do is become a church that just wants to work hard, that just wants to not quit, that just wants to, uh, uh, to, to tear down false teaching, to point out false teachers. If that's all that there is, if that becomes the sole purpose and the motivation for that purpose, then we've missed the whole thing. As we see from this church, Jesus does commend them for this, but he also points out the problem that existed in this church. He says in verse 4, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. The problem that existed there was they weren't in love with Jesus like they used to be. They weren't in love with Him like they used to. The passion that existed for Him and His things was gone. They were still doing what they were supposed to do, but the motivation for doing that had now left. And this creates problems. This creates problems. We're not given here specifically the state of this church and what what these problems would cause. But Jesus tells us, and when you read the first chapter of Revelation, as a matter of fact, the end of it, some of the symbolism that is in here is very easy to interpret. A lot of people stay away from the book of Revelation because, yes, there's symbolism. Yes, there's pictures that are given. And we're like, "Ah, I can't understand that. I get confused. I just stay away from it. You don't have to stay away from it. If Jesus didn't mean for you to understand this, he wouldn't have put it in his book. And he says, uh, back up in verse 20 of chapter 1, As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So when he says, back in verse 5, If they don't repent, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place. What he's saying is, if you don't get your motivation right, your church is not going to exist anymore. If you are not doing what I've told you to do because you love me, your church is going to shut its doors and it's going to close. How many churches today are shutting their doors? It is staggering. How many churches today, just in our country, are shutting their doors? We're actually, uh, the Southern Baptists are doing a big push right now. The big focus for the North American Mission Board is church planning, church planning, church planning. But they're also doing something else where they're sending missionaries to churches that are dying or dead. They're sending these missionaries to uh, what, what seems to be the, the norm is th- they will go in, they will shut the church down for six months or so, get all the people that are there, start, serving, start doing church basically at somebody's house, building that nucleus back up together, and then they'll reopen the church. They've got church... Plan, not, not church planners, but these missionaries that go in to revitalize, to bring back dying churches. That's a huge push they're doing right now. But even with all that's being done, churches are still closing at a faster rate than what we're planting them. How many churches are shutting down for not loving Jesus? This, the, the kind of church that this creates whenever all the work is done, all the service is done, we're, we're doing everything like we're supposed to, but we, do it, we don't do it because we have a love for Jesus anymore. This creates legalism. It creates a Pharisee type of church where it becomes about the rules. It becomes about the doing stuff. What that becomes is a, it's, it's a checklist sort of relationship with, with, with Jesus. Where as long as I do this, 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 and this, I'm good enough. Where as long as I have gone through and I have served here, I went here, I spoke up for the name of Jesus here, I've done all of that. I have done. It is about me. I have worked like that. 
then what I am doing is I am coming to Jesus and saying, here is my righteousness, Jesus. Look at all I have done and how good and awesome I am. And it becomes about a bunch of rules. And it is no longer a relationship. The relationship with Jesus becomes built on what I have done and how good I am. This wouldn't even last that well in my home with my wife, right? Where I do need to do stuff, right, to stay on her good side. Guys, we realize this, right? I hope you do, otherwise your home is probably not that great. Um, We have to do stuff, right? But even my wife realizes I ain't perfect, that I do mess up, that of myself I am not that great, Not without Jesus. So why do we come to church where the one who knows my heart completely, the one who knows me better than I know myself, the one who knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, if I even have a tomorrow, why do I come to Him and say, look at all I've done. Look at me. Check me out. We see this happen in real life, don't we? Where... Service gets done, where work gets done, but the passion that initially drove us there is gone. Whenever we see a, a, a kid who falls in love with a sport, right? And that's awesome. Love to see a kid fall in love with a sport. But they do it so much and they work so hard at it and it, that passion goes away and it just becomes a job. That's a problem. I hate seeing kids like that. Those are the kids that quit playing the sport. Those are the kids that fall fall away from that. Or we see it in our homes where a, a dad who loves his kids and wants to do everything in the world for them and wants to be there for them and works so hard to make sure their needs are taken care of that he gets wrapped up in work, afraid he's not going to be able to meet those needs, and before long the kids are grown and out of the house and he's wondering where time went. That's a terrible thing to see. I work with a lot of kids whose dads are not there at all. We see it happen in marriages a lot. We see this this same kind of problem happen in marriages so many times. And as a pastor, I see it way too many times. But I sit back and I ask ask myself the question, how how many marriages suffer and or eventually end because one person doesn't love the other person like they used to. Now, this is definitely not a, a, a sermon on marriage and whether or not that is a valid reason, it's not. But marriages do wind up ending because one person just doesn't love the other person anymore. They go through the motions, right? They still wear the ring, they still go to the same house, they still call themselves married, they still go to places together, they still do things together, but that love is gone. And as a pastor, I have seen this way, way too many times. Normally with devastating effects. Not always. Not always. Jesus can heal these situations, but normally, normally it's horrible. I have had a man sitting on my couch before talking to me and my wife, whose wife... Just did not love him anymore. And she was leaving. And wasn't just leaving. This was one of the worst cases of leaving I have ever seen. She had decided that she was, she found somebody else. She was going to leave this guy, run off with him. And this guy actually lived in a different country. So she was going to move to another country and actually did. She packed up and she was leaving and moving halfway around the world. And this guy is sitting on my couch wanting to serve the Lord and want, loving Jesus and wanting to do His will. And despite everybody else telling, it, telling Him to let her go, divorce this woman, be done with her, He won't. He won't. Because He knows that God's perfect will, what God wants to happen is to heal that marriage. So He stays back and He waits to try to work on this marriage and try to heal it. And the pain I watched that man go through. I will tell you that... it. At the end of that, that marriage was healed. They are back together. They are where God wants them to be, or at least closer to it. But that's a terrible place to be. And whenever whenever the, the love that was there at first is gone, and it just becomes going through the motions, that's eventually what happens. Things suffer and things fall apart. 
And that was a terrible example of it, but it is in no way the worst that I have ever seen. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, the first person to tell this story. I may be here but I'm, uh, to, to you guys, but I'm not the first person to tell this story, but I'm going to use it to try to illustrate a point. Uh, I want to try to do it justice here. I'm not going to tell you the names of these people, because if I did, you would know them. But it's the best way I know how to illustrate this point. Um, there, wa- there was a guy I knew who was completely in love with this girl. Uh, to the point that down south we would call him smitten. He was definitely taken uh, with her, even to the point of like acting stupid around this girl, like guys do. When, we're, when we fall for a girl, we do things that don't make sense, and that's the way this guy was. But the problem was, she was not into him at all. Now, she may have uh, uh, not hated him, and she, I, we, we never heard this girl like say anything bad about this guy, but she was not interested in him at all. And this dude would try to do everything to get this girl to agree to go out with him. I mean, everything. Uh, except like going to the lake or the river because he couldn't swim. But other than that, he would do just about anything, trying to, get, trying to convince this girl to go out with him, and she would not. And we tried to tell him, dude, leave this girl alone. She wants nothing to do with you. Stay away from her. And he would not listen. And he spent so much of his time trying to get this girl. He, he wasted so much of it. But that, that's definitely not the worst part of it. She finally did interact with him a little bit. She began to, uh, uh, to use this guy. Where she'd have something break at her house. This dude was pretty much a uh, 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 jack-of-all-trades sort of guy. A handyman. She would call him and have him come fix it. Because she knew he would. He'd be over there in a heartbeat to fix things. She would use him as the shoulder to cry on whenever things were wrong, right? Guys, we, yeah, we definitely want to be there uh, if, if we care. We want to help out with that. But normally, the, the thing she was crying about was other, other guys that she was dating and getting her heart broke. And, yeah, you could imagine the pain that he felt with that. And with all that she was doing, I mean, when you're, on the, when you're in the middle of that, you may not be able to see it. This guy could, but... Us on the outside, it's like glaring at us. Dude, this is what she's doing. You've got to stay away from this girl. It, it, stop wasting your time. But he would not listen. Definitely not the worst part of it. All of us kept trying to convince this guy to let this girl go to absolutely no avail. And he kept, he, he, he kept trying to win her over, and it just did not work. But you can imagine our surprise when one day... They showed up together, and she had a ring on her finger because they had gotten engaged. And this dude was over the moon to the point, uh, like when you see a guy who's, who's had something great happen and he just can't stop talking about it and tells you the story like 14 times because he can't remember and he doesn't care that he's already told it to you the other 13 times. That's the way this guy was. He was completely taken with her, but we could kind of tell that she might not have felt the exact same about him. Like I said, it wasn't like she hated this guy or spoke bad about him. She spoke good about him. But it it was almost like she loved the idea of being married more than she loved the idea of him. If you've ever seen that. The love was not there. And this, this guy, he was smart. He could tell. He knew. But he wanted this girl and he married her anyway. So it wasn't exactly getting started on the right foot. But that was definitely not the worst part. As you can imagine, when a marriage starts off like that, problems start to creep in pretty early on. Pretty early on. She definitely began to ignore this guy, became disinterested in him, would start to do things that uh, in a marriage you definitely don't want to happen. She would stay out late. He wouldn't know where she was. She would go places. He wouldn't know where she was. And problems just kept creeping in and creeping in and creeping in until finally the inevitable, the unavoidable happened. She had an affair. But that's definitely not the worst part of their story. She came to him. She confessed it. He loves her. He still loves her. And we're all like, man, I, I, don't, I, don't, know, I don't know what it is. But he still loves her. He forgives her, takes her back. He tries to work on it. He wants to save his marriage. But inevitably, the affair happens again. And again, and again, and again. (sighs) That wasn't still the worst part of what happened to them because 
He forgave her, took her back. She agreed to work on the marriage. And this guy wanted to do anything he could to save his marriage. So he brought, brought her in. They had counseling. We tried to counsel them separately as a couple. Try to, try to start doing all the things that you do whenever a marriage or a relationship is in trouble and you try to build it back up and work it back together. Uh, try, they tried to start talking a little bit more, trying to gl- grow back closer. They even did one of the things that uh, uh, all of us are encouraged to do once we get married. They, they, they started to have date nights again, right? Uh, like, like, like they used to. And... Yeah, things weren't great, but they, they were trying. She seemed to be putting forth an effort, and he definitely was because he wanted to save this marriage. And they would, he would do whatever it took to make sure they had these date nights, to make sure they had time just for themselves away from everybody else. Uh, sometimes what they would have to do is meet up after work for those. They couldn't go together, so they would meet at a restaurant or meet somewhere uh, so, so they could have this time together. And one night, they met up after work, They had to drive separate, uh, and when they left, it was raining. She's driving in front of him. He's following her. She takes a curve a little too sharp, drives off the road, and lands in, uh, I I don't know if they're called something different up here. It, It lands in a retaining pond, one of those big holes that they dig to catch water runoff, right? Lands in one of those that is deep enough that the car goes underwater. He does what any husband would do. He stops, gets out, and waits for what seems like an eternity because, you know, when things are going wrong like that, time seems to slow way, way down. And he stands there waiting for her to pop up, thinking, okay, it didn't look too terrible. Yeah, the car is underwater, but expecting her to pop back up out of the water, and she doesn't. So he figures, he does what any, what any one of us who are husbands would do. He finds the closest thing he can, a, a, a rock. And he, I guess he figured what he would do is he would jump in, try to bust out the window or something, figuring she was stuck and get her out. And the only thing I can think of is since he, he knew he couldn't swim, was he, he would get her out and he would be able to fight his way back up. But he definitely tried. Guy picks up the rock, jumps in the water, does see that she is stuck and manages to break out the window and get her out, shoves her back up to the top and she pops up. She winds up getting over to the shore, but he never does. Never made it back out. All after one of those date nights where he was trying to save his marriage. But uh, that's still not the worst part because she's on the bank. Yes, it's not long after that, police, paramedics, all those guys show up. They get her taken care of. They get her dried off, right? She walks away from it completely and totally unfazed by what he did. If you, whenever you meet her today, it's like it never happened. Yeah, you can tell things are a little bit different because she appreciated the life insurance that he definitely purchased for her. But... Uh, You wouldn't know that anything ever changed about her. But even still, that's not the worst part. Because the worst part is, I will tell you exactly who this person was to help illustrate this point. Because you and I both saw her whenever we got up and looked in the mirror this morning. Because that person is you and that person is me. And there's a lot of times that's exactly how we treat Jesus. That's what Jesus is talking about here. This whole idea that we go through the motions, this whole idea that we do things for Him, that we go through the checklist, that we, yeah, try to serve hard, try to serve well, don't want evil, won't stand for sin, and we'll stand up and we'll say what it is and we'll say that that's wrong and we'll say that that's false, but we don't love Him anymore. Or the love that we used to have and ain't there anymore. So many times that happens. So the question for this morning, the question that I ask myself, the question that I have asked myself long before I ever stood up here and asked it to you, is why do we serve Jesus? Why are we here? 
Is it because it's what we were raised to do? Is it because it's what we've seen our, our, our parents do? Is it because it's the right thing to do? There's a lot of people that go to church just because, you know what, that's the right thing to do, or that's the moral thing to do, or that's a good person. You're a good person if you, if you go to church. Ask somebody if you're a Christian, yeah, I go to church. That's not the same thing. Why do we serve Him? We have to remember Jesus. Our focus cannot be anywhere else but Jesus. If you are living for Jesus, if Jesus has saved you, if you know Jesus Christ, you cannot have any other motivation for doing the things that He talks about doing except for the love you have for Him. If there is another motivation that gets in the way of that love, that's when these kind of problems start to creep in. That's when they start to show up. We've got to remember Jesus. We have to remember just how awesome He is. And He lays this out here. If you go back and read Revelation 1, where John, the apostle, the one that Jesus loved, according to the, uh, uh, according to the Bible, who has not seen Jesus. John, by the time he writes this, John is 80, 90-ish years old, by, by our best estimates. And when he was walking with Jesus, he's probably teenager-ish. Hasn't seen Him in so 60 years, give or take. When he meets Jesus, the way chapter 1 reads is John hears a voice and he turns around to see who it is and he gets this image of Jesus and this picture of Jesus and he falls down like he's dead because of how awesome Jesus is. At the sight of Jesus, it drives him to the floor. How often does that happen with us? How often in our life can we look back and say, you know what, maybe not... Seeing Jesus with our own eyes, okay, that's a different thing. But when we see Jesus show up in such a way that it is only Him, that it drives us to the floor because we are struck by the awe of Jesus. Has that ever happened? Have we ever sat back and thought about how much Jesus loves us? I mean, have have you ever taken time to just sit back and ponder that thought? The love that Jesus has for me. Thinking about what He left for us. You want to know a measure of how much somebody loves someone else? Look at what they're willing to give up for it. That tells you uh, how, how valuable it is. We used to have a saying in sales that anything is as valuable as what somebody else is willing to pay for it. Did you look and say, have you ever thought about what Jesus was willing to pay for you? We describe heaven from God's Word Yes, there are things we can know about heaven. Yes, there are things that we know about it just from looking at what God has told us. But there is stuff up there that God has not shown us and for good reason. If we knew how awesome it was up there, what is waiting for us, just how great that would be, that would create problems in our lives today, I am pretty sure. And Jesus left that for you and me. And not just heaven itself, but the glory He got that was due Him from heaven, in heaven, He left that to come down here to pay for you and for me. Have we ever spent time thinking about that? Have we ever spent time thinking about how He loved us when we could not be loved? And this is more of remembering where we were when Jesus met us. I hate the thought of where I was when Jesus met us, but met me because of how I was. I hate that I was like that. But the thought of that shows me just how much He loved me because I, looking back, I, I hated myself for being like that, but He loved me then. He did not come to buy me whenever I was standing up here trying to teach His Word, trying to pour my life into the lives of kids, trying to raise my family the right way, trying to do the things I should be doing. He loved me whenever I was completely and totally the opposite of that. And He still loves me. He still loves me. Have we ever sat back and thought, has it ever taken us, how He loves me right now? I know all the stuff that Jesus has done for me. This church knows the stuff Jesus had done for them. And yes, they were serving Him. Yes, they were doing things like they should. They were doing the right stuff. But how often did they show up to Jesus and bring, here's my righteousness, here's what I've done, look how good I am, 
Look at what I bring to the table. And Jesus is standing up there saying, you don't bring anything except me. Why are you trying to do that? How many times do I do that and Jesus still loves me anyway? How many times do I slap Jesus in the face with my sin? When you read God's Word, when you, go, go back to uh, uh, Psalms when David is, is dealing with this sin that he committed with Bathsheba and God had showed up through Nathan and pointed out David's sin and David is broken and, and repentant. What does he say? He doesn't tell God against this woman, against this family, against my people, against the, that I, I, I've sinned against all of them. He doesn't bring that up at all. He says, against you and you alone have I sinned. David realized that his sin was more than just a, an affront to God. It was more than just breaking the rules of God. It was breaking the heart of God. Do we realize that every time we sin, it is breaking the heart of Jesus? The Bible says that those that have been saved... Us, those that are born the children of God, we're no longer the slaves to sin. We're no longer supposed to be living in that. And every time we do that, we're saying, we're leaving Jesus and we're going back over here and we're saying, huh, let's try this again. Or we're saying, you know what, I trust me and my thoughts more than I trust God and His thoughts. How much of a slap in the face to God is that? And yet, Jesus still loves me. Even when I do that. Now folks, don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand God's word here. When he's saying, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent, do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. He who has an ear, let him hear. He's not saying by any stretch of the imagination that this puts you at risk of him letting you go because that's some of the awesome some of the awesomeness of the love of Jesus he's never going to let you go if you have surrendered to him and you realize, you've been saved you are saved to the uttermost and he cannot will not let you go ever that is not what this is saying what this is saying is if we get to the point where we don't love Jesus like we did at first that creates problems in our service to Him. It creates problems in our walk with Him. And this is the kind of life that we start to live. This is the kind of person that we become. And that is not the kind of Christians Jesus expects us to be. He expects us to be Christians that are motivated by a love for Him. That realize just how awesome He is and how much He loves us. And expects us to grow in that love for Him each and every day. Can we honestly sit back and say, after having been saved for X number of years, or X amount of days, or weeks, or months, or however long it is, that I love Jesus more today than I did then? Can I say that? Have I grown in my love for Him? Because that's the way love works, isn't it? It's... I'll use, use my wife as an example, and I wasn't planning on doing this, but it's okay because she's not in here. She won't be in the second service either, so I will be able to use it then too. I, I can describe a guy like that being totally smitten to the point of being stupid around a girl because you've totally fallen for them because that's the way I was with my wife. 100%. And I, told, I didn't understand her at all. I don't understand her a great deal now. But I'd understand her a little bit more. Uh, I've got to know her in ways that uh, I, I would say even her parents don't. Uh, I can read my wife. I can a lot of times figure out what she's thinking even without her saying it. I know what makes her happy. I know what breaks her heart. I've learned these things about her. How? Through experience. We've been through things together. We've been through good things. We've been through bad things. She's been there whenever things have been really hard for me. I've been there when things have been really hard for her. I haven't been perfect by any stretch of the imagination, and I never will be. But I can honestly tell you that I love my wife more today than I did almost 12 years ago. That's the way a marriage should be. That's the way we teach our kids. That's the way we want things to be. We want Because I'm, I'm here to tell you, if you get married to somebody... You know, the whole goal is as many years as possible, right, till one person dies. You're talking like decades and decades and decades. A year is a long time. 
with somebody if you're not growing in that. Like just the, just the attraction part of it alone, a, a, a relationship at longest can last like three to five years, I believe is what uh, uh, studies show. Three to five years. If you want a marriage to last any length of time, it's got to be more than that. You've got to grow in that. Why would we expect a relationship with Jesus to be any different? How do you get Christians that are, oh, I hate to use this term, but none of you are in, in here are this, so I can use it. How many Christians are just mean, old Christians? As a pastor, I, I, oh, you guys think we're perfect, we're really not. There's some people I don't like to be around. I don't like to be around mean, old Christians. They're hateful. They really are. Why? The love of Jesus can't be there like it was, if that's the case. It, it can't. Whenever you don't grow in Jesus, whenever you don't love Jesus more today than you did yesterday, whenever I'm not focused on how awesome He is and how much He loved me and how much He loves me when I could not be loved and what He left for me and He still loves me now, even though I still mess up. How could I ever stay where I am? How could I not grow in my love for Him? So looking at this, asking the question, seeing what Jesus says, we have to ask ourselves, why do I serve Jesus? What is my motivation? What, what makes me get up in the morning and walk out the door in the name of Jesus? And is it anything but love for Him? Is it anything but love for Him? If I get to the lowest common denominator, is there anything else but Him there? Have we ever even experienced the love of Jesus? There may be somebody in here who never has. If you haven't, if you don't know this kind of love, and all you do is heard people talk about it, this is the kind of love that Jesus is offering you. This is the kind of love Jesus came to die to show you so that you could be paid for like this. So you could be set free from your sin. And He wants you to turn away and stop trying to do things on your own. Stop trying to be good enough because you're not, and I'm not, and none of us are. He wants to save you. But if you are saved, do you still love Him? Are you still in love with Him? Are there areas of our life that we have shut Jesus out of? Or that maybe we used to let Him in, but we don't now? I have posed this question to myself before I stood up here that I ask you to ask of yourself. And that is, if my relationship with Jesus is gone right now, what about my life looks different? If I don't have a love for Jesus right now, if that just completely left, what about my life looks different? Not what about brought me up here today. What about my day-to-day -day life would be different if I didn't love Jesus? And is the answer anything? And if it is, how much? That's a scary question. Do I love Jesus like I should? Do I love him more today than I did yesterday? Because it's only that love for Jesus that we can go out and do what he's called us to do. And that is reach the world with the gospel. And if I love Jesus, I will want to go out and do that. If you are here and feeling like you, you don't love Him like you should or don't love Him like you used to or you know that it's not exactly what it should be, the good news is He still loves you. The good news is He hadn't let you go. He's still there. His love for you is not diminished one iota. He still likes you. And He wants you to know Him more and He wants you to be closer to Him. And He offers us this same the, he offers this same promise to us that he did this church anytime we find ourselves here and that is when we leave our first love he says come back come back to me repent and come back